Baptist video or J Gospel of John video this morning, only because I want to take a few minutes and just kind of talk through the conference, and that's two minutes saved on the video. So you can say, Pastor tried to be shorter this morning. He cut the video out. He tried, and he failed, but he tried. <laughs> and uh, so, and I just want to recap for those of you who weren't here for part of the conference, I'm going to just talk through some of it, and maybe we'll share some more personal testimonies on um, our prayer meeting night, Wednesday night, but uh, God just blessed us with uh, the opportunity, uh, for those of you who don't know, to have a conference uh, this past week for pastors mainly. Uh, anybody wanted to come, but it was mainly geared towards pastors and ministry leaders. So we had 24, I think we ended up having 24 different churches represented, and uh, about 65 ministry leaders that came. Um, some came to serve and some came to be served, and then you came as well, and many of you did. So we had a full house. Our parking lot was completely filled. People parked in the street. People blocked the parking lot off by parking in places that weren't parking spaces. It was packed, um, and we praised God. We added 30 chairs Wednesday night, so all of the chairs we, we, that we have were added, and it was just, uh, it was beautiful. Um, so Wednesday night, Pastor Josh, Josh Smith from Cowan Mill Church spoke. He spoke about a variety of things, and uh, he would just step down and just fire away, and he'd come back, look at his outline, reload, and step down again and fire away some more. It was great. I almost brought the pulpit down for him to save him the reloading time, but I think he needed it, and it was wonderful. And man, at the end, he wept over Father God's love and just shared that with us, and you could just feel the tangible presence of the Lord in the room. And you know that your feeling is correct when people come and just get ministered to. Um, we had a, a lady, a, a, um, um, husband and wife, pastor and pastor's wife, that only came one night. And they came and they got touched by the Lord. And um, I think there's a lot of things that God wants to do in their life. And, uh, and so there was, there was uh, just some, some beautiful things. Just came one night and God showed them that he has power and uh, touched their hearts. And I think he showed them there's some things he's going to do long term, and he gave him previews of that, and in, uh, in healing and different things. Uh, many of you just had, we had like a Wednesday night prayer meeting Monday night, right? We just moved around the room, we prayed. I sat with a couple I've never met, an evangelist. He's like, I don't know where I'm at, I've never been anything like this before in my life. Grew up, you know, King James only, all that. And he's like, but this is amazing. He's like, God's in the room, and I've never felt him like this before. I said, why are you here? And he said, I have, we have an afflicted child. And... Um, you were one of the few people we trusted to talk about healing because you know our background and we just don't know really how to feel and how to pray for, uh, for our child. And boy, throughout the week, you could just see God touch he and his wife in special ways. It was beautiful. Tuesday, Pastor Jared and I, we tag team taught. Uh, Tuesday morning, I started with uh, teaching on communion, testifying about communion, and then pastors and pastor's wives just all over the room just kind of got, they took the elements and just went by themselves in the room and just had communion. And you could tell that none of them, some of them had never done that, that way before. And God moved in a beautiful way. And then we started our prayer rooms. So we had, a R, we had two RVs here because we needed extra rooms. We used all the rooms in the church. We used upstairs room. We used all the nurseries. We used the kids' way room. We were going to use the bathrooms if we had to, but we felt like it'd be a little hard to get free in the bathroom. And, uh, and so we, we used all the rooms we had. We had uh, 30 different volunteers helping us run prayer rooms. Pastor Jewel brought a crew, and Josh Smith came, and he brought a couple. And Vance and Laura Murphy from Atlanta Revival Center brought a couple. And so we had prayer rooms going everywhere. And you'd see these pastors kind of walk out nervous. And it's great seen a pastor nervous, you know, he's always leading and now he's following and he's nervous, like what am I getting into? And, and the reports that came out of the prayer room, one guy said, he said, my dad abandoned me in 1976 and I've hated him every day since until yesterday. And he broke down and he wept. And he said, I forgave my dad yesterday in your prayer room. And um, oh, it was just, just so powerful to hear how God moved in forgiveness and, um, and profound and so we taught uh, after, the, after communion while people were going to prayer rooms. The rest of us sat together. Pastor Jared taught in the Old, Old Testament and the Holy Spirit, and he just set it up. And he showed the Holy Spirit is the same uh, yesterday, the same today as it was yesterday. And then I took the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit through Jesus and in Acts. And then um, we, break, we broke for lunch, and then um, we had Chick-fil-A catered in. That was fantastic. And then uh, Pastor Jared taught two sessions on spiritual gifts. 
and um, it was just wonderful. And, and several people commented that their favorite part of the conference was just the teaching and seeing what the scriptures say about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then um, a Pastor Jewel shared a testimony, and we went to dinner, took a dinner break. I got a seven-minute nap, and uh, then uh, Tuesday night, uh, I preached on um, There's More. Um, Apollos was preaching in the name of Jesus, and then an Ananias Sapphira grabbed him, and they said, hey, but there's more for you. And so I gave a testimony about our church. I gave a very raw testimony about my, my own life and some of my experiences, and then some testimonies of preachers who've been struggling, and I kind of wove those together, what some, some preachers I've talked to have been feeling and why we need the Holy Spirit to come into our churches and to come into the lives of the pastors in a greater measure. And, whoo, uh, the Lord moved. Uh, more than we expected. And throughout every service, every time we had a worship set, people gave testimonies. So Rusty testified Monday night about what God's done in his heart. Uh, Tuesday morning, Katie testified uh, about what God did in her heart. And then uh, Tuesday night, Justin testified about what God has done in his heart. Wednesday morning, uh, Candace Long testified. And then Wednesday night, uh, Joe Hockstock testified, and every testimony was just beautiful, just to, to hear what God's done, and, and, and perfect for what God had for that service. And so Tuesday night, we, were, we didn't finish till 12, 15. What's crazy is everybody left, and just our church people were here, and we said, let's listen to I Thank God, and, uh, and just let's decompress a little bit. And so it was beautiful. It was precious. Um, uh, we were all so moved by how God moved in, in the hearts of pastors uh, and people. Uh, Tuesday night. We had a great church, Antioch Church. They started three different churches in YMCA's uh, in, the, in Mason, Warren County. They brought, I think, a total of about 20 people throughout the conference, and they were just so thankful. They were so kind, and um, God did beautiful things in their lives, and, and, and so it was, it was just beautiful how they interacted and how God moved in their hearts and lives, and so we were thankful for local churches. We had other local churches represented as well here. On uh, Wednesday morning, Vance Murphy testified uh, about his ministry. He's been pastoring Atlanta Revival Center for uh, 25 years and just testified how he was just uh, an alcoholic and a mess, and God delivered him from that and filled him with the Spirit and has put him on this journey. He talked about the different, um, or, uh, different opportunities they have to minister around the world, places like Guatemala, where they are sending thousands of dollars a month and then going several times a year to um, uh, get feeding centers going and to see God touch lives. He talked about being in Mozambique and seeing people healed, seeing uh, retinas grow in eyes. Um, he he uh, shared later with a few of us uh, seeing uh, two of his church members at different times who had died, and he went in, and the doctors were ready to pull the plug and, and just unhook everything, and then they were um, raised up after being declared dead. So those are some, you could see some guy's eyes go about that big. Like, wait, what? <laughs> we were okay with like the random pain in the hip being healed, but used it, you did what, and said what, and saw what? And so that was just neat to see God um, uh, moving people's hearts through testimonies of different people from different places. And then um, uh, during the day, Pastor Jared, uh, uh, I taught on deliverance before lunch, and then after lunch, we did a prophetic kind of whole afternoon on prophecy. And we passed out those prophetic journals. So many of you have been praying all week that God would, or all, I'm sorry, the last two months, about that God would, uh, would um, uh, t- speak to you and give you a word for the people who are coming. And you don't know these people, Right? And so we finally got to pass those out. We were excited about what uh, the Lord was going to do through those. And the testimonies of those were very special, very sweet. We're still hearing some testimonies coming in about those. Uh, And again, one guy said, my son overdosed on drugs um, two months ago. And he gave the date. He said, this person prayed um, over, um, felt the Lord tell me Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. And they dated and timed their prophetic word. And it was the day my son overdosed. And he just broke down and cried. And uh, so several testimonies like that, prophetic journals. So just thank you so much for your hard work. That was, that was awesome. And then Pastor Jared led everybody. He said, all right, hey, let's, we, we, we declare what it is, and then we demonstrate what it is. So let's, let's let God prophesy through us now. And so people listened, and then they, they sat down next to a stranger, go to somebody you don't know in the room, and they, they sat down and said, Lord, what do you want me to tell this person? And again, uh, the tears flowed as God spoke through people who'd never prophesied in some cases, and they prophesied over pastors, uh, came to us and said, in some cases, that was the best thing. Like, we're going to go home, and we're going to teach our people to prophesy. And um, we had no idea. We had no idea. 
And we didn't tell him how messy it is. And, uh, and uh, no, but you know, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And, and it's so, it, it was just beautiful. Um, and then we took dinner break. And then Dan Bohai flew in from Kansas City just for Wednesday night. And Dan was this like whole different thing from the conference, right? It's just totally different. He came in. He uh, reads his Bible through every three weeks. He quoted dozens of scriptures. He called us to holiness, right? We came for healing. He called us to holiness. And that was great. And then uh, several people saw healing. Several people were prophesied over. Several people were just touched by the Lord. It's different. I'm sure for many of you, it was a different experience, different type of service. It's probably the first time you ever heard a Nazarene preach. And, uh, and you're, pro- you're probably your Baptist antenna went off a couple times, right? Like, Nazarene, every time he said it, like, I can't. Uh, and you tremor a little bit, that's okay. And uh, we, uh, we believe in the body of Christ, and we believe that the whole body of Christ can edify each other. And I think we were edified wonderfully. And I called my mom afterwards, said, Mom, what'd you think? And she said, well, I'm kind of embarrassed. I've had a hard time walking lately. My hip's been hurting, but I hadn't told anybody. She's like, and when Dan said, pain go, she said, I just felt it leave my hip. I felt so good. She's like, but then I was embarrassed because I hadn't told anybody I was hurting, so I didn't give my testimony. I'm like, Mom, you would have saved us 10 minutes because Dan was waiting for you to testify. Uh, he was like, I think there's another testimony in the room. And, uh, and, and she, she laughed. But, but, but dozens of people, I mean, and, and, and I think none of us will forget him calling Dee up and speaking life into her and then praying um, uh, over you, Jen, and, and then just, man, it was just precious. And what I wanted, our, I wanted the pastor, my pastor friends to see was my church get ministered to with the gifts that we taught all week. And Dan did that beautifully. That's what we wanted, and that's what he did. He ministered to us while pastors watched. And um, I think they began to see, oh, there's more for my people than just me preaching on Sundays. Like, my people need to be touched by the Holy Spirit. They need something I can't give them. So it was so cool to see. And um, throughout that, my joy was to watch so many of you serve and uh, give of yourselves. The prayer rooms ran beautifully because of your hard work, Um, whether it was just the scheduling, the shushing of people downstairs so that the prayer rooms wouldn't be interrupted, um, the cleaning of the bathrooms. We had a bathroom trailer right here. We had extra bathrooms because of the number of people here. It was just, uh, it was amazing. Thank you, church. Can't wait to continue sharing testimonies with you, but that's all I'll do this morning. Uh, We're in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So we're on a third week in going through John's gospel. Our first lesson was the word became flesh. What's the logos, right? The word. Our second lesson was the forerunner, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. What does it mean to be a prophet? What do we learn from this prophet? What does it tell us about our lives? And that was exciting. Today, we learn what it means to be a disciple. What it means to be a disciple. Uh, That's a word that Again, denominations take different terms, right? So a disciple, when you hear disciple, hey, I'm a disciple of Christ. That's a denomination in American culture. And it's different than what a Baptist is. So we, we kind of shy away from words, right? Tuesday night I preached on the, the next step in the Holy Spirit, but I, I, I was careful. I used the phrase, and I kind of joked about it, the phrase the baptism of the Spirit, because the denominations take in that phrase and they use it. We talk about Pentecost, which is in the Bible, and we think of Pentecostals. So there's some terms that have powerful meaning, but because of just the, the schisms in the church, the division in the church, right? Jesus said, by this, you'll, by this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And ever since then, disciples have been splitting off and hating each other. And, uh, and so we've, we've got we to get back to love. And uh, we may not agree on everything. Now, those of us in the room, we don't agree on everything. But we, we've learned that Oh, we can edify each other without being in complete agreement. You can be in unity without being in complete agreement about, about certain things. And, uh, and uh, so we're learning. We're learning that. We're learning that we don't have critical spirits. We don't have divisive spirits, but we want to love each other. If somebody loves Jesus, I want to love them. Okay? If somebody loves Jesus, I want to love them. So John 1, uh, you read the odds with me. I'll read the evens. Let's go through, go through some scripture. We see the first disciples heading there. Verse 35, ready, begin. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. So that's John the Baptist. And as Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's disciples heard this, 
They followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. And they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Philip went to look for Nathanael and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. You don't know me. (laughs) That's what I think. That's my translation, what it would be. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And Jesus asked him, Do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? (laughs) Hang on, buddy. You'll see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth. You will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Lord, would you guide us now? I surrender my mind and heart to you, Holy Spirit, and guide the teaching of your word this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. So there's a lot there. And we could slow down, but we wouldn't get through John until 2026. So this is our third week in just chapter one. I've got it outlined to work through and be done by Easter. Spoiler alert. He rises from the dead at the end, okay? So that's, uh, sorry to ruin the book for you, um, but that's that's where we're going to be at uh, at Easter. And uh, man, what a good book this must be, huh? So um, we see a testimony here, a series of testimonies that are taking place in this book. We uh, have the prophet John the Baptist declaring something. We have brothers introducing Uh, each other to Jesus. We have friends introducing friends to Jesus. We have Jesus prophesying into a disciple, and then we have Jesus prophesying about who he is. And so some beautiful things that take place in this passage. So what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? Um, We're always wrestling with, and I think it's a healthy wrestling, with being the kind of follower of Jesus that the Bible describes rather than the kind of follower of Jesus that the American church has defined, right? That's a, there's, a, there's a battle there, and it's a battle for pastors, and it's a battle for churchgoers. Um, am I in love with Jesus? Am I following Jesus? Or am I attending and participating in church? If we as a church are unified around following Jesus, the church is going to be fine. But if we are treating church like a program, a community center, and our following of Jesus doesn't drive our participation in church, we really miss out on what God has for us. Following Jesus, you know, should, if we're following him properly, it should really kind of change how we look at everything else. Right? If, you, if you look at your life and try to apply the life of Peter and Andrew to your life, it really changes how you follow Jesus. Right? Peter said, I want to follow you, Jesus. And the uh, Bible says he left his nets. Right? He left his, in, in, in one of the synoptic gospels, both of them, or, or, or two of the three, it says he, he left his nets. They forsook all and followed him. Andrew had already done this. Andrew had followed John the Baptist. So Andrew and I think John, the gospel writer, John the disciple, 
who leaves his name out of the story, but is in the story. There's two disciples that were following John the Baptist. One is named and one is not. And so Andrew is the one. Andrew, he leaves following John the Baptist because John the Baptist said his whole ministry was somebody's coming, somebody's coming, somebody's coming. There he is. And when he said, there he is, Andrew said, well, I guess, you're, I guess I'm done following you. And John the Baptist was fine with that. John the Baptist said, look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew said, if that's the guy, I'll see you, John. Thank you so much for your life and ministry to me. You've been such a blessing to me, but I'm going on to better things. I'm going to the Lamb. That's a powerful, that's a powerful thing. That's a painful thing, I think, for John the Baptist. And yet he knew that he had to decrease and that Jesus had to increase, that his influence had to decrease, and that Jesus' influence would now increase. And so Andrew and John leave, and Andrew spends some time with Jesus, and he's like, i got to tell more people about this. And when you spend time with Jesus, you're going to want to tell more people. That's just how it is. Uh, if you have a hard time sharing the good news of what Jesus has done or what the Holy Spirit's done in your life, spend more time with him. Reflect on what he's doing in your life. Let him change you. Let him transform you, and then you're going to want to tell people about it. No, what we want is for God's presence to be here in such a way that when you leave, you got to tell people about it. We don't want to... Uh, um, push you and cajole you and guilt you into testifying about Jesus, we want you to be so in love with Jesus that it just comes out as a part of the overflow. Where it's not a sales pitch, there's not three points and a prayer, right? We understand the, the elements of the gospel, okay? But, but when I see what Jesus has done for me, whew, then I want to tell somebody. And that's, that's the change. Then I don't care what people think. I love Jesus more than I fear man. I love Jesus more than I fear man. That's, that's where we're trying to get to. I love Jesus more than I want money. I love Jesus more than I fear poverty. I love Jesus more than I love my career. I love Jesus more than anything. Having forsook all, they follow Jesus. That's the idea here. And Andrew says, Peter, I know you're doing well fishing. You're going to be doing really well when Jesus tells you where to cast your net. But I'm just telling you right now, Peter, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go find. This is the one. He is here. This is the one. And so the prophet's declaration, John the Baptist says, there he is, Andrew and John uh, begin to follow Jesus. And then we see the brother's introduction, and we see a transfer of spiritual fathers, a transfer of spiritual fathers. And this is really where I think the Lord wants me to, to rest in the text this morning. I want to talk about mentoring and fathering. So Part of Jesus' ministry that we talked about this week, we talked about doing the stuff, right? The, he said, preach the kingdom, cast out devils, and heal the sick. But two other elements that we saw of his ministry that came out were raising up spiritual leaders, right? Spiritual mentoring, and suffering. And so we tried to kind of encompass his ministry. He had messages, which is preaching the kingdom, personal conversations, parables, preaching. We have healing and miracles, we have freedom, deliverance, we have suffering, which is its own sermon series, which none of us want to attend, and, uh, but we will, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering, Paul said. I carry about his death in my body so that I can proclaim his life, Paul said. Suffering. But then this morning, I want to talk about spiritual leaders. We want to raise up spiritual leaders. Our church has, uh, is a small congregation filled with leaders. I praise God for that. Men and ladies alike who have great gifts from the kingdom and you're, you, you have leadership capabilities as given from the Lord. So John the Baptist is a spiritual father to Andrew and to John. And they transfer their spiritual father uh, uh, from him to Jesus. So there's spiritual fathers and physical fathers. And men, I believe that the first spiritual father your kids should have is, the, your, is you. Right? Their physical father should also be a sp spiritual father. Being a father, listen to this, being a father is prophetic. It's prophetic. When you father somebody, you are modeling for them what they can be by your example. But you're also portraying for them and defining for them what they can be by your words and your actions. So my example, when they look at me, right, I give them an example of what a dad should or shouldn't be. One of, our, one of our most basic and common forms of behavior is based on our experiences. So when I am married, my default husband mode that I fall into, if I'm not careful, is the husband mode of my dad. 
because he was the marriage I watched. His was the marriage I watched growing up. So experience is my primary and first teacher. If I had bad experiences, right, I have to relearn, I have to unlearn my experience and relearn what a good husband or good father is. Okay? So because of that, because of that principle of life that experience is your first teacher or your strongest teacher or your default teacher, you have to understand that what your children are experiencing from you it will be their baseline for what kind of husband my sons will be, what kind of father, fathers my sons will be. I am prophesying into their life through their experiences. That's a tough, that's a tough thing to carry, right? Right? We should like soberly, sacredly, humbly, and meekly go to the Lord and look at that mantle of being a father. And, and really pray over it, really labor over it, regardless of where you're at in life. You might have adult kids. Great. P- pick up the mantle of being a dad again. Not a dad of a 10-year-old. That's a different thing than a dad of a 30-year-old. But you're needed. You're needed. You're, you're, that mantle is needed, that you'd walk in it. So being a father is prophetic. Jesus said, follow me and I will what? Make you fishers of men. He defined what they were going to be by his words. And then he exemplified that. He modeled it and he taught them. Growing up, my dad was very prophetic, though I don't know if I ever heard him use the word. There were times when I'd sit down and he would speak into me and I could feel myself growing. His words would just feed me and nourish me. That's how I was that's how I was created. I was created to be fed the word by a father. And uh, ultimately, to be passed off to my heavenly Father so that his word would feed me and nourish me. That the words of the body of Christ would edify me. I'm created to be fed by your words. I'm created to be fed by this word. I'm created to be fed by the Spirit's word to me. I need to eat off it. That's how I grow. I need that nutrition. So we see in Jesus him building people up already as soon as he calls them. Are you the one? Come and see. You're going to see some beautiful things. I'm going to make you something. I'm going to make you into something. Nathaniel, there's no son of Israel like you. You are the epitome of what it means to be a son of, an, a son of Israel. Whew. Words to my spirit. Nathaniel's like, that's so heavy. That's so beautiful. It can't possibly be true. <laughs> so he says, how do you know? Because I watched you. I've seen you. I know how you feel. I've heard how you feel. Oh, that must have just pierced Nathaniel's spirit. You saw me alone. You saw me. You heard me. We don't know what Nathaniel said, but we know he was seen. Dads, your kids need to know that you see them. I see you. I haven't forgotten what it was like to be 12. I know what's going on in your 12-year-old brain. I know what's going on in your 12-year-old friend's brain. I know the stupid things they say. I remember the stupid things I said when I was 12. I know what you can be. I've read enough stories about 12-year-olds who grew up to be 30-year-olds, who grew up to be 50-year-olds, that I know that you can grow up and be that. I know Billy Graham's story. I know what he struggled with when he was 12. I think you could be Billy Graham. I think you can be a hero one day if you find courage now. Now, I'm giving away my secrets as a dad in front of my kids. But I believe that my words from the Holy Spirit to my kids are what they're going to feed off of right now. Look, you can give them the simplest Bible translation, but it takes a while for a child to learn to feed off the word. But do you know what will make it much more edible for them? If you chew on it for a while with them and feed it to them. When I chew on the word and I give it to my kids, they receive it. When they read the word straight, they're still trying to eat that fiber. <laughs> they're still trying to eat that, that, that healthy meal. But when I chew on it, and I break it down, and then I feed it to them, and it comes from my overflow, and they don't even know. I'm not like, thus saith the Lord, you know, thou shalt be. 
No, but I'm, I'm chewing on the word, and then if it comes out, then I'm able to build up and fill. That's my prayer. That's what I hope. I don't know if I'm succeeding completely. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't say I've arrived, but I know that's our call. Right? I know that's our call. I know that's my call as a dad. I know it's a call, by the way, for husbands to, to, to minister to wives and wives to minister back to husbands, that you should be able to feed the word. But being a father is prophetic. John the Baptist said, one day somebody's going to come and you're going to follow him. And when I know who he is, you'll follow him. And Andrew knew when the time came, John the Baptist had portrayed for him and had, had shown him. He had defined who the lamb was. And when the lamb came, the prophet said, there's the one I told you would come. He's here. And Andrew said, okay, I'm going to go follow him. And dads, we should be preparing our children to follow Jesus so that when they encounter him, they'll know it and they'll follow him. Being a father is prophetic. Being a father is prophetic. Your words build, your words can bless, or your words can burn and curse your children. You know what you always do that annoys me? Stop. Being a father is prophetic. You know one thing I hate about you? Stop. Being a father's prophetic. You know what you always struggle with? Stop. Being a father's prophetic. You know what I love about you? Do you know what you do so well? Do you know what I see you accomplishing in your life? You see, I know what you're feeling right now. I know the peer pressure that comes with being a teenager. And so I, I, I don't know specifically what people are saying, but I just want you to know you're seen. I think about you. I think about you while you're at school. I think about you while you're sleeping and I'm still awake. I think about you. Oh, I, I like my sports teams and I have my hobbies, but you're always on my heart. You're the one I think about. Mom and I, we think about you. Mom and I, we talk late in the night about you. Mom and I, we pray for you. Mom and I, we think about, we, we love you. Being a father's prophetic. I see your tears. I see your struggle. I think I know what was going on in your heart. Maybe I'm wrong. But let me ask. Let's talk. You hear me say this a couple times a year because it has to be said. Years ago, they used to have this weird oblong piece of furniture in houses. It would sit like awkwardly in the middle of the main level. And people would sit around it and they'd eat. There was no TV there. And they didn't have cell phones yet. So you just had to like sit. You'd look at your food and you'd look at the person who was sitting next to you eating. It was awkward because you'd have to look at their eyes, see their facial expression. It was called a dining room table. Maybe you had it outside your kitchen, you called it a kitchen table. That should be the headquarters of your home. Not the TV, not the bedroom, but that table where the family gets around, they look each other in the eye, and you see, what are you struggling with today? If you want, it, it, when, when a parent is surprised that their child is struggling, it's because they've been going through a season where they haven't looked in their child's eyes. Because if you look them in the eye, and you've been looking them in the eye for, for all their life, then you know when the change comes. You're not surprised. Because I, I saw your eyes last week, and I see your eyes tonight. And I, your eyes are different tonight than they were last week. So what happened? In our prayer rooms, I, always, I encounter so many people who say, my, kid, my parents had no idea what happened to me. And I don't even have to ask them, did you guys have dinner together much? It's not that they're good actors, that their parents were not, not observing. The heart of the Father is I see you. That's the heart of the Father for Nathaniel, as revealed through Jesus. The heart of the Father is I see you. I saw you. I saw you crying out. I saw you weary. I saw you discouraged. I see you. I see you dreaming. I see you hopeful. I see you comparing yourself to your siblings. I see you feeling not as loved as other people. That's the heart of the Father. I see you. I see you. I love you. And I'm going to help you. I'm coming to you. And I'm going to call you to me. And I'm going to show you things. I'll show you what it is to be a man. I'll show you what it is to minister. I'll show you what it is to love. I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you sacrifice. You know there's things I love, but I don't do them because I love you and I want to spend more time with you than do those things. I am your father and that's what matters most to me. The king of the universe who set the planets in place, who orders the galaxies and names them all, whose span covers the entire universe. He could spend his presence and give his thoughts and 
give his attention and, and put his eyes towards so many billions of places. But he puts his eyes on us and he looks at us and he sees us. The king of the universe saw Nathaniel under the tree and he said, I saw you. I could have been looking at Mars. I could have been looking at Saturn. I could have looked across the Milky Way. But I looked under a fig tree and I saw you. You're the one I'm looking at. I've created amazing spaces. I've created amazing places, but you're the one I want to see. Your heartbeat is my favorite glance. It's the favorite thing I listen to is your heartbeat. When your tears fall, I count them and I collect them. Your tears. Your tears. You can't count the stars, and you can't count the sands of the seashore, but I can count your tears, and I can count the numbers of hair on your head. You're who I love. I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. This is what you could be. I'm telling you, listen, listen. I know I'm preaching, and some of you tune out right there when I raise my voice and I go in preacher mode. Listen. (laughs) The people around here in these houses, the people who call 45069 their zip code, the people who call the United States their country are dying to be seen. They're dying to be noticed and to be affirmed, to be built up. We're created to live off of the words. Created to live off of the words. Some of you, Dan prophesied over you. How those words make you feel? Like I was fed. Why? Because he spoke Father's love over you. He fed me. You don't find those words elsewhere. Right? You don't find them at your job, do you? Your boss ever call you in and prophesy over you? Not unless you're a pastor, probably. Customers at Walmart taking good care of you guys? They're speaking good things to you? No? They don't build you up, edify you? Yeah. Chick-fil-A drive through they build you up, edify you? No? The state of Ohio builds you up, edify you? No? No? Bid fat negative? Yeah. So we come together to be fed off the word. And we've got to leave realizing our responsibility to feed our children and feed each other off the word. Being a father's prophetic. We see blessing. And, and as we look at how Jesus leads his disciples, oftentimes we've been preached, because we live in the land of plenty, we've, all, we've oftentimes it's been preached of what you have to give up, right? And Jesus says you, you have to lose your life. Right? You lay down your life. Lose your life. To the rich man, what do you say? Sell everything you have and follow me. Oh, Everything? <laughs> everything? Right? We hear all that and our minds go to like, I can't, I, can't, I can't follow him. But we forget the other words, right? You'll find your life. You'll get me. I have the words of eternal life. I'll bless you. And so if we follow Jesus, he's going to build us up. He's going to fashion and form us. So we see the prophet's declaration and the brother's introduction. And, and in this, Jesus renames Peter. And what does this remind you of? Okay? If you go back to Genesis 35, the Bible tells us the story of the trickster, the deceiver, the liar. I mean, this is the con man, right? the original con artist, Jacob. Right? Jacob the con artist. You remember the story? He stole his brother's blessing. He stole from his father-in-law to get back at his father-in-law because he gave him the wrong wife. It's a bad day. We leave a divorce yet? Because I don't want her. She's tender-eyed. That's what the Bible says. And uh, I don't know what it means, but it must not have been good. And, uh, and so uh, that's, that's, that's this is Jacob, the con man. He's the con man. And he encounters the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord's like, okay, I killed 186,000 people, but I'll let you hold on to me. Right? So he's wrestling. Jacob's wrestling. And he thinks he's doing a good job, you know? And the angel's like, you know, let me go. <laughs> let me go. Angel's, oh, he's wrestling. Jacob's not, you know, and, and what happens? In that, he says, I want a blessing. And the angel looks at him and says, okay, you used to be a liar, and now you're Israel. <laughs> I'm changing your name. I'm blessing you. You will be the father of God's people. You're the place of blessing. You're a walking blessing. Okay? So when God fastens his eyes on somebody, who's going to be the father of something, he changes their name. At least in Jacob's case, that's what he does. So what does Jesus do? 
Hey, Simon. I know we don't know each other. I know you're Simon, son of John. You're not going to be Simon, son of John anymore. Wait, what? Nope. You ready for this? You're the rock. Dwayne Johnson ain't got nothing on you. You're the rock. That's what he called him. You're the rock. The original, the rock. This Peter. You're the rock. You're Cephas. Rock. Upon you, a new, a, a new birth has taken place. You're going to birth it. It's going to hurt. You're the rock. You used to be Simon, but you're Peter. Petra. Cephas. The rock. And from then on, it's like, hey, rock, what do you think? Hey, rock, what do you think? I, I think you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. You said it, rock. Later on, I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to be uh, betrayed, and I'm going to be killed. <sighs> no, 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 you're not. I'll never let it happen. Hey, rock, don't be the devil. And then after he betrays Jesus, at the very end, spoiler alert, it's the end of the book, he, betray, he, he denies Jesus, not betrays. Uh, he gets off the boat, and Jesus says, hey, Simon. Mm. For three years, he called him rock. At the very end, he calls him Simon. I'm like, you live the old way. I saw the old guy come out. Simon, you love me? Yeah, you know, Lord, I love you. You're my rock. You rock. You're going to be the foundation of the church. Prophetic, right? A blessing. This is how I think of you. This is who you are. This is what you're going to be. When the whole church is facing persecution, there's going to be one guy who is rocking Jerusalem. It's going to be you. When everyone is confused and doesn't know what to do, they're going to gather around you and they're going to look to you and you're going to be the leader. Not because you're qualified, really. You're kind of, you kind of got a quick temper. You don't really bear many of the fruits of the Spirit, but you're the rock. And when everybody's afraid, they're going to get around you. And you're going to have seasons where people throw themselves in your shadow and they're healed because you're the rock. You're my rock. I'm building on you. That's, a, that's a, your representation of me, Jesus the rock. Right? You exemplify one of my characteristics. And that's my faithfulness and dependability. And that's what you're going to exemplify. John, maybe he'll exemplify my love, but you're going to exemplify that I have, I'm a firm foundation. And so then we see this Jacob theme continuing, and I've got to skip ahead because of time, but we see the friend's exclamation, now Philip, who we don't see do a lot. This is not the same Philip as the deacon in Acts. This is a different Philip. But we, we see Philip, um, go to his friend Nathaniel and say, hey, you got to come and see this. So Jesus said, come and see to Andrew and to Peter. And now Philip says, uh, come and see to Nathaniel. What could come out of Nazareth? Just come and see. You'll see what good it is. He is awesome. Nathaniel gets the blessing that we've talked about. That's the Savior's compassion. I see you. I love you. I know what you asked for. I've been watching you. I heard your prayer. And here I am. And then we see the Lord's declaration. So at the end of John 1, Nathaniel's just so impressed that God saw him under the fig tree. And I think we'd all be impressed. We'd all be moved by that emotionally. You heard me pray, you saw my cry, and you've answered it. And the Lord says, I know, I know that's cool. But the best is yet to come. That was great. That is great. But the best is yet to come. At church this week, whew, it was great. But the best is yet to come. Yeah, I mean, 60 ministry leaders, 65 ministry leaders, 24 churches. Whew. Praise God. It's not about the numbers, but those are some sweet numbers. But the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. I, saw, I know we saw miracles, but you haven't seen anything. You haven't seen nothing yet. The best is yet to come. And Jesus looks at them, his new followers, and he says, I am Jacob's ladder. So he, changed, he does the name change thing to go back to Jacob. He says, but I'm Jacob's ladder. Jacob dreamed, and he saw a staircase. He saw a portal to heaven. Right? He's laying down at Bethel. He'd name it Bethel at that point. The place where I have God's encounter, the place of God's presence. House of God. He's... He's laying there sleeping, having just lied to his dad, stolen from his brother, and run for his life. He's laying there. Does he deserve this? No. Is he worthy of this? No. Does God love him? 
Yes. Why? Because God loved his dad. God loved his grandpa. And God loves him. And so Jacob's laying there, and he's sleeping, and all of a sudden he has a vision. He sees a staircase. He sees that heaven is connected to earth, and that there is this connection, this like staircase between heaven and earth. Earth, I'm sorry, heaven knows what's happening on earth. They're watching it, and they can actually come and go. Angels come and go. He sees angels going up. He sees angels. Messengers are coming and going. He sees messengers. These are the kind of messengers that went to Hagar and found her in the wilderness and said, hey, it's going to be okay. God sees you. These are the kind of messengers that would appear later to, to Mary and to Joseph. These are the kind of messengers that would sit in an empty tomb and say, he's not here because he's risen. Heaven knows what's happening on earth. Heaven's not oblivious. Heaven's not distant. Heaven's right there. It's like a few steps away. And Jacob gets up and, wow, what did I eat last night? You know, That was insane. I got to get some rocks. Get some rocks. I got to make a pile of rocks. Makes a pile of rocks. This is an altar. This is where God is. God is here. Now, God is not on that patch of dirt where those rocks were put. No. God is with Jacob. And God is moving among his people. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I know the fig tree thing was great, Nathaniel, but I want you to understand something. I'm with you. I am the door to heaven. I'm not the way you get to heaven. <laughs> I'm the way that you connect with heaven. Not just the way you get to heaven. I'm your connection. I'm going to teach you to pray in such a way that you can see heaven come on earth all the time. You won't have to have a dream. And that won't be your only way to see heaven opened. Through me, you're going to see angels going up and down, messengers going up and down. You're going to see the angels descend on me. You're going to see them minister to me. You're going to see me break the veil that has always hidden my presence from earth. And now heaven is going to be wide open to anyone on earth who wants it. I'll be honest with you. Most churches, most Christians, they don't leave with their mind thinking about heaven being open to them. Right? Don't set your affections on things on earth or moth and rust do corrupt. But set your affections, set your mind, set your heart on things above. Because through Jesus, you can see exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so Jesus says, that was great, <laughs> but heaven's coming. That was great, but you're going to see the earth shake and you, the skies go black and hear a dying man yell, it is finished. And you're going to see heaven open. So hang on, Nathaniel. The best is yet to come. So church, I just want to encourage you this morning that Jesus opens the door to heaven. If you feel like heaven's blocked off and your prayers aren't going anywhere, it's because you and Jesus haven't sorted things out. If you feel like <laughs> you don't understand this revival that's happening in our church, or you don't understand um, why your prayers don't get the responses that other people in the church's prayers seem to get, it's because you and Jesus have to sort some things out. If you don't have any eternal security or peace in your heart. You don't feel peace. You struggle with fear and anxiety and guilt and shame because you haven't been given the light burden from the Prince of Peace. And you and Jesus have to sort some things out. It's the Spirit of Jesus. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Jesus is the model for Abba Father. If you don't know Jesus, you're not going to connect with Father God's love. If you don't know Jesus, you're not going to be filled with His Spirit. We need Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm the, I'm the portal through me. You could experience the wonders of heaven. You could experience the kingdom of heaven on earth. The kingdom of heaven advancing. The health of heaven advancing. The blessings of heaven advancing. It's breaking through and the best is yet to come. And so this, this morning, church, let's take some time to pray. 
Jesus said, if you call on me, I'll answer you. If you call on my name, I'll heal you, I'll rescue you, I'll deliver you, and I'll save you. So let's take some time to pray as a church. I would love to encourage you to get into a posture of prayer. If your health allows it, would you kind of get out of your seat, maybe go pray with somebody, or kneel, come forward to the front of the church, what we often refer to as a place of, of an altar. This morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you're living under the curse of sin, the curse of death, Jesus died so that we could have eternal life. He wants you to accept Him, to trust Him, to accept His gift of eternal life. He never sinned, but He became your sin and my sin so that we could be reconciled back to God. So, Jesus died so that your sins could be washed clean, that you could become a child of God, just like Jesus is. Jesus is God, and he is God's Son. So what he wants you to do is repent of your sin. Lord, I'm a sinner. I know it. I've been lustful, deceitful, dishonest. I've made a lot of mistakes. I want you to repent of your sin. He wants, to, he wants you to accept his forgiveness. That he's, he's washed your sins away through his blood. And so Jesus, I, I want your sinless blood to wash away my sins. Your pure blood to wash away my sins. And I trust you. I trust you to wash me of my sin and to transform my life. I'm giving you my life, Jesus. I want to be a follower of yours. And Jesus gives us a new name, right? We're no longer sinners. We're sons and daughters. A simple prayer of faith placed in the eternal God as revealed in Jesus Christ. A simple prayer of faith changes your name from sinner to saint, from sinner to son and daughter. If you've never done that before, I'd encourage you to do that this morning. Jesus is enough. He is enough for you. Moms and dads, I want to encourage you to not forget that second point this morning. That your words matter. That you need to speak life into your kids. You need to speak life into your children. You don't need to be corrective all the time, negative all the time, sarcastic all the time. You need to be a blesser. Abraham blessed Isaac. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Jacob blessed his 12 sons. He prophesied their destinies through the Holy Spirit. Being a father's prophetic. Men, it's not just your kids. There's people around you who you're supposed to build up and edify and bless and mentor and train your maturity, your mature faith, your love for Jesus should serve as an example that builds others up. If we're always looking at our own problems and looking at our own struggles, and looking at our own desires, we can't ever see our kids under the fig tree. We can't see the opportunity to raise up spiritual heroes, spiritual heroes, servants, godly servants. God's calling us to prophesy, to look, to listen, to build up and edify.